Live from Case at 12, the night beat starts right now. We're sounding the alarm. Uh, if you thought it was over, it's not. Continue to do what we were taught from the very beginning, and we can get this back uh, within grasp. Mayor Ron Nuremberg reacting tonight to the largest rise in COVID-19 cases and hospitalizations in Bear County since this pandemic began. Tonight, we sit at 436 new cases, bringing our total to 4,876. That's about 9% of the county's all-time number of cases in just a single day. Meanwhile, the death toll now stands at 89. Hospitalizations hit a new high for the seventh day in a row. Right now, there are 212 patients in local hospitals, with 82 in the ICU and 41 patients on ventilators. Since the pandemic began, 2,343 people have recovered locally. And with more cases, there's a need for more what they're calling contact tracers. The health experts working around the clock to track infected people and those they may have come in contact with. Metro Health revealing tonight that their investigators just can't keep up with the amount of cases. So now it's outsourced contact tracing to a health company. The night team's Jaffney Gray explains the crucial role of contact tracers during this pandemic. That is a critical component of understanding the spread of this disease. That critical component Dr. Don Emmerich with Metro Health is referring to consists of two steps, case investigations and contact tracings. She says the investigation process takes about an hour to do with each case. And it is a long history of exposure, asking them where they've been, who have you been exposed to? When did your symptoms occur? But to start the investigation, a COVID-19 patient must answer the phone if they don't. We don't get this information. We don't know where they are. We don't know when onset is. We don't know the, le the number of people that have been exposed. It literally ties our hands from doing our job. Another obstacle they're facing. 436 positives. We can't catch up. Mayor Ron Nirenberg says the need for contact tracers has within two weeks gone from 25 contact tracers up to 100. Emmerich says that means they need more staff. We're here now. We're at that spike. And so it has created a massive delta in our ability to do this case trace or the case investigation and the number of positives that keep coming in. They are now having to outsource contact tracing to a health technology company. Once Metro Health does the initial investigation, the company calls those who have been in contact with the infected person. A crucial step in stopping the spread of COVID-19. But get folks, identify them, get their, their close contacts who we need to do case tracing on, and get them isolated in quarantine. Get them in their homes or get them into a place where they're not exposing anyone any longer. City officials warned that if the cases continue to rise, our hospitals will be overwhelmed. However, they did say they do have a plan in place. Freeman Coliseum here is prepared to hold about 250 hospital beds. Now, it'll take about seven days to get this place up and ready to go if needed. But that's something that city officials say they hope does not have to happen. Daphne Gray, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Jaffany. Governor Greg Abbott today pointing the finger at young adults for the surge in COVID-19 infections across the state. In San Antonio, people ages 20 to 29 make up the largest number of infections by age group. 1,145 cases. That's about 23% of the overall total. That's followed by people in the 30 to 39 year old age group. Tonight, we hear from a 30 year old bar worker who says he was one of those young people who shrugged off concerns. The night team's Patty Santos tells us he's now at home sick with a hefty hospital bill. I just didn't think it would affect me that much. You know, I'm in decent shape. I'm 30 years old. I don't get sick. I was super ready to go back to work. I needed money. Bradley Veers just got home from a five day hospital stay after facing a 104 fever, pneumonia and other symptoms related to COVID-19. I wore a mask at work and I wore gloves and stuff just like we were supposed to. So I didn't think it would affect me. The Northside bar worker says he knows at least two dozen other people in the industry who recently tested positive. As the number of infections continues to surge, Mayor Ron Nirenberg says he's sounding off the alarm. Younger folks, you're not immune to this. 
More than 60% of our cases are now among those aged 20 to 49. The number of people ending up in the hospital, in the ICU, or on the ventilators is also rising, and they're getting younger. Governor Greg Abbott pinning the blame on young adults, too, for the state's spike. The people who tested positive since the beginning of June have been people under the age of 30. It's hard to tell exactly where those people contracted COVID. It could be Memorial Day celebrations. It could be a bar setting. I think it's true. I think that it was, uh, I think that they should shut them back down. Facing a 30 plus thousand dollar hospital bill, Veer says everyone needs to take COVID-19 seriously. Not even a percentage of people wear masks when they go out and party. They don't care. They, they don't have a clue that it could affect us the way it did. And the city says another possible spike in numbers could be seen in about four days as we might begin to see some positive cases resulting from the protest that started about two weeks ago. Steve, Myra. All right, thank you, Patty. If you're wondering whether another stay at home order could be issued, that would have to come from the governor. The mayor says the state has stripped away all of the city's power to order people to stay home. The city and county can only make recommendations, and that includes recommending people wear face masks. Mayor Nirenberg and eight other Texas mayors are urging Governor Abbott to give them the authority to set rules on the use of face coverings. In a letter to the governor, they say a one-size-fits-all approach is not the best option. During a press conference today, Governor Abbott pushed back on allowing counties to make masks mandatory, saying, quote, all of us have the collective responsibility to educate the public that wearing a mask is the right thing to do. Putting people in jail, however, is the wrong approach for this thing, end quote. A lot of Northside ISD parents say they are worried about COVID-19, but most of them seem comfortable sending their kids back to school. And ISD released a new survey tonight about how parents are feeling about the pandemic. The district also revealed a new task force that's looking at how it will safely reopen schools in the fall. The night team's Tiffany Huertas reports. What will school look like uh, in August? A new task force at Northside ISD is helping identify what school will look like this fall. The team consists of about 20 members from the district. The group presented different recommendations during today's Board of Trustees meeting. Everything from class changes. On the left, you'll see a typical 806 square foot classroom and see we can fit up to 16 students with their desks being six foot apart. To school bus changes. Transportation in our typical 72 passenger bus will now be limited to about 12 students. The group also made several suggestions on remote learning. So while we look at a lot of options here with regard to only very small groups of students in the building, that is not the goal. Uh, and pending state guidance, that will not be uh, what we recommend. We're just trying to explore all of our options and cover what the public health need is along with what families desire. The district also released key findings of a survey where thousands of NISD parents responded. 50% of our parents are very concerned about COVID-19 impacting their health and the health of those in their household and a plurality of 47% do not think people in the community are taking this seriously. 58% of parents are also concerned about their child falling behind because of remote learning. NISD said it will continue the conversation with staff and families. The Texas Education Agency said it will be releasing its guidelines next week. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. New video on the night beat showing the moment Bear County deputies were shot at while lending a hand to a stranded driver. This happened 10 days ago on June 6th. It was 3.30 in the morning when deputies tried to help the driver near Wood Lake Parkway and Ben Zingelman Road. While that was happening, Sheriff Javier Salazar says someone in the distance fired toward those deputies. Shell casings were found 200 yards away. No one was hit, but the search for the shooter continues. Information leading to an arrest can get you a cash reward of up to $5,000. Call Crime Stoppers at 210-224-STOP. A now former deputy facing three charges tonight. Among those charges, the Bear County Sheriff's Office says Brandon Doji is accused of tampering with a government record. Sheriff Javier Salazar says Doji was heavy handed in his force 
as a cert deputy and did not activate his body camera during the incident. Footage from another deputy's camera caught the questionable moment. What really, really bugged me about it is that during the video, during another officer's body worn camera video, when it was reviewed, you can actually see him reach up and, and switch off that other deputy's camera. Uh, not acceptable. Is Sheriff Javier Salazar says an overhead camera in the booking office caught the entire incident. The other two charges filed against Doji are official oppression and assault. Sheriff Salazar says Doji was terminated from his position and in a separate case last year, the Medina County Sheriff's Office opened a shooting investigation involving Doji, who was off duty at the time involving a woman who was shot. Nearly three years after a drive by shooting killed four year old Irvion Whitley, four men have been arrested in connection with that case. According to the Bear County District Attorney's Office, police arrested these four men over the past two days. Terrell Chase, Todd Hill, and Quentin Phillips have been charged with murder and deadly conduct. All four men have been charged with being a felon in possession of a firearm. In July 2017, gunmen fired 65 shots into the child's home, killing him. D'Urvion's mother was also home and was injured. At the time, the shooting was linked to gang violence, but no one was charged until this week. More arrests could also be coming. San Antonio police say they're still looking for 26-year-old Michael Woodard and 38-year-old John Chapman in connection with this case. Both are wanted for murder and deadly conduct. If you have any information, call SAPD at 210-207-7273. Tonight, tonight's San Antonio police asking for your help in finding this man, 20-year-old Elijah Scott, last seen in the 3000 block of Northeast Parkway, wearing a burgundy hoodie with a yellow shirt, blue jeans and Nike shoes. Police say Scott has a medical condition and is in danger. If you have information as to his whereabouts, you're asked to call SAPD at 210-207-7660. And this was a nice sight to see today. Look at this rain gauge, an inch of rain. Even looks like a little bit more than an inch in Westover Hills neighborhood. So we did see some pockets of those isolated downpours earlier today, particularly on the west side of San Antonio and into Western Bear County. That was nice to see. It was good. Not quite as much as yesterday, but at least some folks cashed in on it. 81 right now at the airport. Port SA is at 82 degrees. It's a mid and upper 70s in the hill country. Kerrville, for example, 76 along with Lost Maples. Now tomorrow morning, you'll notice the humidity. We'll have some extra clouds overhead just for a few hours and temperatures are likely to be in the upper 60s in the hill country. Even Bernie area 68, 72 uh, near the airport in San Antonio and for the most part low 70s around town. We'll be back to talk about the Saharan dust and when it's expected to arrive. Coming right up, Myra. Thanks, Adam. Still ahead on the night beat, a grid forecast model shows that nearly 200,000 people could die in the U.S. by this fall. But there's new hope in the form of a new treatment for COVID-19 from the UK. And later at 1030, we're talking with the president of the San Antonio Police Officers Association about the calls for police reform and the state of our police force. That live conversation coming up. A new forecast model from the University of Washington predicts as many as 200,000 people in the U.S. could die from the coronavirus by October, partly due to states reopening, many seeing a rise in the number of cases. But tonight there is hope out of the U.K. where scientists have discovered what they're calling life-saving treatment for the sickest of COVID-19 patients. ABC's Rena Roy has the story. Health officials warn we have a long road ahead in the fight against COVID-19. At least 20 states and Puerto Rico now seeing an increase in infections and 14 have a rise in hospitalizations, including record highs in North Carolina, Texas and Arizona, where doctors are concerned about hospital capacity. There's very few hospital ICU beds in southern Arizona right now. Florida seeing its highest number of new cases in a single day, more than 2,700 in 24 hours. In Miami, officials have halted the next phase of reopening just days after beaches there opened up. Kat Layton says she and at least 12 of her friends tested positive after going to a Jacksonville Beach bar last weekend. If we're not paying attention to what is actually going on and we're just kind of opening things up, 
we're going to contract it and we're going to kill people in our own community. Governor Ron DeSantis insists the higher numbers are likely due to more testing. We really expanded the drive through and the walk up sites. And now we have pop up sites at retail locations. And, and that's thousands and thousands and thousands of tests a day. Amidst those new grim numbers, a possible breakthrough. Doctors at UK's Oxford University say they have the first drug that improves survival rates in the sickest COVID-19 patients. A low-cost common steroid called dexamethasone was shown to cut the risk of death by a third for patients on ventilators and reduce deaths by 20% for those on oxygen. We've improved their chances of coming off that ventilator a lot. The drug reduces inflammation and appears to help lungs fight the virus off. Scott Krakauer was in the ER and says it helped relieve his COVID-19 symptoms in just hours. This was like a big, a big difference, a huge difference after I went on the IV uh, steroid um, that I felt. Today's results were so encouraging. British doctors announced they'll start treating patients with the drug immediately. It is different from another virus treatment, remdesivir, which speeds up recovery time but has not yet been proven to improve survival rates. Rena Roy, ABC News, New York. Look outside with live cam tonight. Some people saw a little bit of brief rain out there today but it just feels like you could squeeze some moisture out of the air. Yeah, are, are we in that pattern where during the day we have a chance of rain? We are, but I think the next few days we won't have quite as much activity okay. on the radar screen. And tomorrow will probably be a little further west of town. So more periodic stray showers, but they were very efficient showers the last couple of days. Isolated, but efficient. That's good. Some of them dropping a little more than an inch. We'll take a look at the totals in a moment. Remaining muggy. Oh yeah, it's June. Mid-June, we're almost at the solstice, actually, and it's going to just stay sticky out there. Temperatures, though, not moving much. They're going to remain right near average for this time of year. All right, here's a view earlier today. This is nice. This is on the west side of town. A little bit of sun, a little bit of rain. That's the nature of this kind of weather pattern that we've been in. And taking a look at the rainfall estimates from the Doppler radar, you see the little swath, basically a little alleyway, of showers that developed earlier today. Now it was between I-35 and I-37 northward all the way through the west side of San Antonio into parts of the hill country and some pockets were lucky enough to get between a half and an inch of rain estimated by the radar and confirmed by some rain gauges on the ground. So this is this was nice here on the SeaWorld area. You know, a little over half an inch measured in parts of the west side of town, especially the Alamo Ranch area. Then you get down near Tilden, and that was a nice sweet spot earlier today where they picked up over two inches estimated by the radar and a nice little pocket there. Nothing on the radar screen at the moment around town here. You have to head all the way out far west of our area, the Big Bend region. But we could see more of this activity tomorrow. It's just most likely to be pushed a little farther to the west, a little closer to the Rio Grande. So again, another roughly 10% chance of rain, but nothing to get your hopes up over. If you get it, hey, just be grateful. You got lucky. It's one of those situations. Upper level high, the ridge is broken right now, but it's stretching all the way into the upper Midwest. Actually, some record breaking highs up north as a result of this. The real active weather. Pacific Northwest, that's that big dip in the flow. And of course, over the southeastern U.S., you see this big circulating upper level low. Our high that's in place isn't exactly strong, but it's enough to keep those out of our area. All right, I want to talk about the Saharan dust and the forecast for the Saharan dust as well. Notice we go from Wednesday on into Thursday, Friday, and by about this time next week, we could see that plume of African dust making it here and a thicker plume of it. We may have trace amounts toward the end of this work week about Friday, but once we get into next week, the middle part of the week, we could have a more dense area of that African dust moving over the Gulf of Mexico and even affecting us here in Texas. So that's something to keep in the back of your mind. Of course, we'll keep you updated on that situation. 93 degrees was our high today after a low of 74. Not bad, 81. Right now, dew point is 61 degrees. And looking at the other area wide temperatures, we're mostly right around 80 with those dew points right around 60 degrees and in the 60s. So we're feeling muggy. 72 in the morning, 93 in the afternoon, decent amount of sunshine, and just those isolated stray shower chances for the rest of the week, particularly Friday into the upcoming weekend. But there are those uh, temperatures not changing much with highs generally 
in the lower 90s and the summer solstice on Saturday. And no triple digits yet. Nope. All right, thanks, Adam. All right, there are still COVID-19 concerns when it comes to our area high schools, and they're not even back in session yet. No, and they're raising concerns because now we're getting positive tests for both Johnson and Somerset school districts. When we come back, who has tested positive? What does this mean to their conditioning workouts? And the NBA players have a deadline to let us know if they're going to want to return to play. We come back. Johnson High School and Somerset School District have announced that they both have employees who have tested positive for COVID-19. But unlike Burbank High School, they will continue their strength and conditioning sessions. Or the school district confirmed in case at 12 Sports today that an employee who tested positive for COVID-19 was last on campus on Friday. Parents were informed of the positive test in a letter from Johnson High School Principal Gary Comalander that went out Monday night that said the employee did wear a mask and that the individual was in the vicinity of several other employees as well as students who attended a strength and conditioning camp. Comalander confirming that anyone who is in direct contact with this person has already been notified. The district has declined to name the employee, but a source tells case at 12 sports the employee is a coach Comlander's letter reads in part will say we are in contact with the san antonio metropolitan health district and they assure us that the risk of exposure is very low regardless we want to inform you of this information as a proactive measure and a similar letter has been sent out to parents in the somerset school district after it was discovered that a somerset isd staff member working with their athletic summer conditioning program has tested positive for covid 19. Every student had contact with this staff member has been notified will be unable to attend any district function for the next 14 days as they self monitor their conditions. Over at Burbank High School, the San Antonio School District has shut down all strength and conditioning activities for at least the rest of this week out of abundance of caution. That's after a coach became exposed to the coronavirus this past weekend away from school and a student athlete was also exposed to the coronavirus also off campus. SIISD spokesman Leslie Price says the student was not on campus on Monday, but a source tells Case at 12 Sports the coaching question was on campus Monday before finding out about the possible exposure later in the day. We first learned there was a problem at Burbank when this tweet appeared on the Burbank football Twitter account last night. It reads, attention all Burbank athletes at this time, strength and conditioning camp has been temporarily suspended until further notice. Please check Google Classroom for updates. We apologize for the inconvenience. Stay safe. That tweet was deleted about 20 minutes later, but not before it created a firestorm. The Burbank shutdown is believed to be the first school to do so in the state since the UIL allows student athletes to return to campus on the COVID-19 hiatus. Meantime, the Judson Rockets are in the middle of their second week of return of student strength and conditioning exercises and participating with this new team is dual threat quarterback Jordan Battles. That's right, the same Jordan Battles who used to be the starting quarterback at Brandeis High School who transferred to Converse campus last fe uh, February, just before the coronavirus shut down all school activities. Battles had helped take Brandeis to the 6A state quarterfinals twice and was a 28-6A MVP last season with over 1,300 yards and 13 touchdowns in the air, another 1,800 and 26 on the ground. And while it's unclear the UIL has approved his eligibility for his senior season, it is clear Jordan is ready to help his new teammates. It feels awesome being in a new environment with all new coaches and me and the team have already kind of created a tight bond, so it's going to be exciting to start with a new team. Now Battles will see what he can do for the Rockets, who finished 12-2 and two last year, lost to Lake Travis 48-35 in the 6A Regional Finals. Offensively, we're just we're fast on, on offense. You know, our receivers, they go and get the ball. So, um, and you know, De'Anthony Lewis, he's, he's a man amongst boys out there. So when I came in here, I didn't think, oh, like, my name's Jordan Battles. Like, no, I, I knew coming in here that I was going to have some competition. And, and you know, we, we got a quarterback situation. Me and him, we're going to go at it. But at the end of the day, we're still brothers. All right, NBA players given a deadline, and the Spurs are assigned their home away from home in Disney World. Next. The NBA has informed all players who do not want to participate in the restart of the NBA season at Disney World to inform their team by June the 24th. And according to The Athletic, the Spurs' base of operation, the wide world of sports complex, will be the Yacht Club, along with the Blazers, Kings, Pelicans, Suns, Wizards, all trying to make the playoffs.
Pro Football Coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. Dallas Cowboys Hall of Fame game against the Pittsburgh Steelers slated for August the 6th in Canton, Ohio, more than likely will be canceled. That's according to the governor of Ohio, as plans now appear for a shortened NFL preseason. And the first casually appears to be the Hall of Fame game due to the coronavirus, even though it stopped short of canceling it altogether today. Having a crowd that size, uh, I think, is highly unlikely. Um, certainly, it could not occur today. It would be very dangerous to do it today. The, probably the last things that are going to be able to be open uh, are, are the big crowds, uh, particularly when you have big crowds that are, 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 close, are close together. So um, we have to c continue to look at it, uh, you know, make decisions as we move forward. But um, if the question was, could that event occur today, the answer would be uh, no. It would just be extremely dangerous. And there's speculation right now that all NFL teams will be limited to only two NFL preseason games and more likely just the last two on their schedule that they have yeah, right now. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Greg. We'll be right back. Welcome to our KSAT Q&A during the night beat here, and we are pleased to be joined by Mike Helley, who is the president of the San Antonio Police Officers Association. And police unions across the country are being criticized for, quote, protecting bad officers. You hear that over and over again. So uh, I offered Mike the opportunity to come on and talk to us about what he thinks about what he's seeing and what changes he would like to see and how he answers those charges about being somebody that protects bad cops, his organization. So, Mike, thank you for joining us tonight, and I really appreciate you coming on to give us your perspective on what you've sure, seen. Thank, yeah, thank you for having me. We're going to touch on a lot of topics here. Let's start here. What is your reaction, both personally and professionally, to the videos that we have seen, the killing of George Floyd, Rayshard Brooks most recently in Atlanta. When you see those, what, what's been your take on that? Let's talk about the first one. Um, you know, my 31 year career, unfortunately, I've, uh, I've had quite a few people that, uh, that I've seen die in front of me and also that I've had to make scenes that people have been uh, deceased. And it was very painful to watch, um, uh, especially when our profession, that your job is there to protect people and to secure them especially if you have them under arrest of your responsibility, life and death. And um, when he kept, which was stunning to me was that the gentleman, Mr. Floyd was polite during the whole time. And he kept saying, sir, sir. Um, and they just ignored him. Uh, and even when he was saying that like, he couldn't breathe, they still uh, stayed on top of him and, and wouldn't allow him to sit him up, do something different than they continue to do what you're doing to put him in distress. Um, that, that in most itself just, was just hard to see. Um, and it was just, um, I can tell you that it's just something that, that doesn't happen here in San Antonio. They're a completely different type of, of, uh, of police departments. And, and I can tell you that men and women in San Antonio um, are professionals at what they do. Uh, they're loving and caring people. Um, and every single one of us were just heartbroken by what we saw on that. Um, the next shooting you talked about, um, I, I think that there's a lot of issues that still need to be discussed about that. And I think there's some aspects of it that maybe the layman didn't or won't see. And it's not for criticism of anybody, but the, so they, at first the, the interaction was peaceful. They have somebody that's intoxicated and they're trying to deal with a gentleman that they're, that they're trying to do field sobriety. And the gentleman is, is, uh, is complying with them. It's only when they determine that he's intoxicated and they want to make an arrest that things get bad. And then that's when, the, that's when they start fighting with each other. Um, the one policeman you see get knocked to the ground does not realize, and I, just what I see, does not realize that the, uh, that the defendant uh, uh, had taken the other officer's taser and then took off running. Um, and I don't remember hearing on the audio either that, hey, he stole my taser, he stole my taser while he's running after the guy. Now, the policeman is getting up now after both the defendant and the, the deceased and, and the officer are chasing after each other. And if you look at the video, if the officer has no idea that he stole the officer's taser, you see him reach back and then discharge the taser. It actually sounds like a small pistol being fired. And then you also see a flash, and it could be a muzzle flash. It's reasonable to believe that the officer that was the furthest behind, he had no idea that he just sees the guy running away. He probably thought that the guy had a gun because they never searched him. 
And then he was firing at his partner. And that's probably why he discharged his gun. I'm not saying that's what the officer, I don't have any idea what the statements he made. I'm just saying from being, from sitting back and getting to watch things. Because my first story, my first reaction was, holy cow, there's no way that guy was justified shooting on that 20, 25, 30 feet because the guy was, because he had a taser. That was just absolutely wrong. But then when I watched it again, I realized, you know what? I don't think he realized that the guy took his, his partner's taser. And then when he heard the pop, it sounds just like a gun. And then from that distance at night, it looked like a gun discharging, especially with the flash of the muzzle. Hey, Mike, 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 when we, Mike, when we moved to San Antonio uh, and we're talking about discussions, you know, you've heard the the defund the police and you've heard the uh, both the San Antonio police chief, William McManus, and the mayor talk about some changes that they would like to see. Is it possible that this could be like a constructive conversation and we don't get into anti-police, pro-police, politics, things like that? I mean, is it is it possible to move this discussion forward? And what would you like to see for policy changes here in San Antonio? Oh, without question. I, I've, I've said that all along. I've already expressed that to the mayor and to the city manager um, and to the district count, to council person that uh, uh, Jada that has a tough constituency. You know, they're they're mad at the police. Not everybody on that side of town, but they're upset. And and we need to work through those uh, reasons why they're upset. And some of them are maybe for cause and some of them are not for cause. You know, a lot of things that uh, that they're mentioning that they want changes are training and other things we already do as a police department. And I'm kind of wondering, like, OK, so what did we do that the folks over there up north did that we're not doing here and we don't do here? Why all of a sudden now we're all getting painted that we're all doing bad things. So I think what added fuel to the to kind of the, the gasoline to the fire, so to speak, is the chief didn't come out and say right away, look, our men and women are not like up there. Our men and women are professionals and we have great training and, and they act professionally on a daily basis. Um, we don't have those issues and those problems. But instead, he came out and said, I can't fire bad cops. And it's because of the contract. And everybody's like, whoa, what are you talking about bad cops? We started throwing out some numbers and people started getting more upset. And it just missed a, instead of just taking the opportunity to really shine and show, look, at, we're not like other police departments. We're great at what we do. Our training is above anybody else's in the state of Texas. We already do most, if not all, of the a can't wait uh, uh, issues that they have. But s saying that, I'm, I'm not naive to the fact that there's some parts of our contract that have been uh, um, some consternation to some folks that they would like to see changed. And we can have that dialogue. And certainly um, there are things that we can change that people feel like, um, especially when it talks about progressive discipline. But we do have officers in San Antonio who have done wrong, who have been accused of wrongdoing. We've reported that 67 percent of officers who have been fired have won their jobs back. They've been reinstated over the last 10 years with an SAPD. So what do you attribute to that? Because that is a high percentage. And I think anybody who imagines their own workplace is trying to imagine two thirds of people who've lost their jobs, winning them back again. What do you think needs to change in order to make sure that officers who are accused of wrongdoing and proven to have violated some policies don't return? Sure. I'm assuming you're talking about the Washington Post article, right? Is that one from because I'm trying to figure out where the 67 percent came from. Because, uh, it actually it actually comes from Broken Blue. Uh, our defenders, the investigation. defenders investigation and the special that we just that we just reran yeah. last Friday. So I'm, I'm going to assume that that number is correct. Actually, when we got off there on 630, I had our work. I called our attorneys and said, we need to check on that number because I'm not sure it's accurate. But but um, there are cases that um, that uh, um, that shocked the conscience. And you wonder how in the world did the guy get his job back when he should have been fired? And we talked to one of them at the 630 hour. Um, most of those cases, if you look at the details of them, it was because there was an error that was committed on the chief or the internal affairs. And, and those errors are critical because when they go before an arbitrator who is a third neutral to anything, he just, it is not represented by the organization and he's not represented by the city. And he's supposed to be the judge that has a, he's not taken aside. You get to present all the relevant facts, everything. And then the, the uh, of course, the officer and his attorney is going to, they're going to present their case of either facts that were omitted or things that were ignored by internal affairs. 
And unfortunately, there have been many, many mistakes over the many over the several years that it's disappointing, but the chief never really has learned from his mistakes and they continue to happen even here most recently, especially when you have discipline that is, is levied based on the on some political issue that might be supercharged for whatever that moment is. And the chief will refer to it's too much of a political hot potato for me. I'm going to have to fire you. You'll probably get your job back. Go to arbitration, and then and then we'll talk about it when you get reinstated. Hey, Mike, and we're running we're running out of time. I want to give you the last word here, though. What's the biggest misunderstanding of the San Antonio Police Officers Association in like thirty seconds? Sure, we we do not, and I repeat again, we do not defend cops that have done wrongdoing, especially criminal wrongdoing. It's not something that we do. Uh, 174 in our contract and in a civil service. All it does is takes the politics out of disciplining our officers and things that might be levied because of politics. And, and that's what it all what we're about. It's just establishing a fair process that gives the employee a fair opportunity to give an argument about why he shouldn't be terminated or fired. But we do not defend bad cops uh, at all. And actually, it's kind of offensive that they keep saying that. Mike Kelly, president of the San Antonio Police Officers Association, thank you for your time and your perspective tonight. And let us know if that 67% figure that we're putting out there is wrong. Sure, I will. Thank you. All right. Take care, Mike. We'll be right back. Today, Americans continue to take to the streets in protest over the killing of black men at the hands of police officers. That, of course, including the recent death of Richard Brooks in Atlanta. ABC's Trevor Alt is there with the latest. Atlanta Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms has announced a slate of police reforms now requiring the department to use de-escalation methods before turning to deadly force. The decision comes in response to the death of 27-year-old Rayshard Brooks, shot and killed by Officer Garrett Rolfe Friday night. There is a deep and abiding commitment on behalf of this administration to make sure that we're doing all that we can do so that another child does not miss the opportunity to have her father present on her birthday. Police body and dash cam footage captured the events that led to Brooks' death. A field sobriety test and attempted arrest, then Brooks struggling with the officers, running away and appearing to point a stun gun at police when Officer Rolf opens fire, killing him with two shots to the back. Brooks' death coming in the wake of the death of George Floyd and a broader national tension over the way police treat black Americans has sparked days of demonstrations in Atlanta as other protests continue across the country every day. Black Lives Matter. In Atlanta, the district attorney is investigating Brooks' death and considering charges against the officers involved. A decision is expected to be announced within the next few days. Brooks' family members say they want the officers to face charges. Not only are we hurt, we are angry. When does this stop? We're not only pleading for justice, we're pleading for change. Trevor Alt, ABC News, Atlanta. Look outside with live cam. It is a muggy night across San Antonio. Seems like it's just kind of socked in right now, Adam. Well, we were we were spoiled last week and into the weekend when we had that nice extended break from the humidity. That was good, but hey, it's June. It's back and it's here to stay. Unfortunately, the aquifer has just taken hit after hit and it is pumping season. I get it. And luckily we had good rainfall through May and now it's dry and the aquifer is down another foot to 663.2 and we're only four tenths of a foot above the average for this time of year. Mold and pigweed both registered but on the low end. All right, let's take a look at that African dusk, the Saharan air layer and notice how we have it a big thick plume of it all the way out over the ocean in the Atlantic. This is all comes off the Saharan desert this time of year and it gets transported westward and as usual, well, we get some of it in our sky and it looks like we'll get some by about this time next week and especially in about eight or nine days from now. So if you're sensitive to the Saharan and African dust, just know that by about the middle of next week, we could have some of it back in our skies, at least uh, more concentrated amounts than just the trace amounts we could see in a few days. So big thick plume of it is forecasted to make it into the Gulf of Mexico by the middle of next week. All right, on the radar screen out there, well, nothing to speak of locally. Earlier today, we had some activity, but now that is all dissipated. It's come to an end, and we just have some 
clear skies at the moment, but the low clouds will be filling in later on tonight. So look at the activity. You see where the Air is swirling a bit in the upper levels right here in the Pacific Northwest. And then we also have it over basically Virginia and the Carolinas. Those are the upper level disturbances, the big broad scale systems that bring good soaking rainfall, which just aren't going to be moving into town anytime soon. Sometimes these over the Northwest dig southward and move into town. Mm -mm. Upper level high isn't strong, but it's enough to keep the door closed for now. For many real organized disturbances. Now, as we get into the weekend, we're see we're going to see the pattern shift just a little bit, and that's going to mean the highs sliding westward a bit, giving us this northwesterly flow aloft, and that usually allows for at least some weak disturbances to move in. So we may have a few extra pop up showers and storms by the weekend, mostly right near 80 across the state, even locally. Widespread 70s to around 80, Uvalde at 80, 75 in New Braunfels, Gonzales at 78. And by the time you wake up tomorrow morning, we'll have some low 70s for most of us in the hill country. We'll be in the upper 60s, some mid 60s as well. Fredericksburg and Junction at 66. Then by the afternoon, we make it to 93 here in San Antonio and into the mid 90s far west of town. Del Rio, Eagle Pass, Laredo, probably mid, maybe some upper 90s there. Otherwise, 10 to 20% chance of rain the next couple of days, and that's going to be all the way into the upcoming weekend. But highs aren't going to change much. Thank you, Adam. Still to come as COVID-19 cases continue to rise, many fear their summer travel plans could be canceled. Some already are. We're going to tell you how to make sure you can get your money back if your flight gets grounded. Recouping your cash from a canceled flight. Well, a lot of times airlines offer vouchers for future travel. While that may suit some travelers, consumer advocates argue you can't spend vouchers at the grocery store. As we head into summer vacation season, 12 on your side's Marilyn Moritz looks at some rights and strategies you should know about. Tierra O'Kelly is headed home after a detour. We originally were going to go to New Orleans, then they had a spike in COVID, so we switched everything to uh, San Antonio. She chose her change in travel plans, but for frustrated flyers whose flights were grounded, complaints about refunds are taking off. By law, if an airline cancels a flight that you have a reservation on, you are owed a cash refund period. You're even due a cash refund if the airline makes significant schedule changes. But travel expert Scott Kai says many travelers are being tricked into accepting travel vouchers. What will happen oftentimes is that the airline will cancel a flight and they'll send you an email and they'll say, hey, Marilyn, sorry, we've canceled your flight. We've already processed a travel credit for you. Click here to accept it. If you're having trouble getting your refund, Kai suggests three strategies. Call repeatedly. Different agents give different answers. File a complaint to the Department of Transportation or dispute the charges with your credit card company. But what if you have an upcoming flight that you're pretty sure you're not going to make? Kai's advice, don't be so quick to cancel. Think of it like a game of chicken. Whichever party blinks first is the one who loses. If you cancel, you are due that travel credit. But should the airline eventually ground the flight, you get your money back. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. Well, it seems you may want to reconsider flights to Mexico if you're planning a trip anytime soon. The U.S. ambassador to Mexico says now is not the time to visit. While there are great deals on travel there right now, the ambassador warns the country is still experiencing widespread community-based COVID-19 transmission. Mexico slowly reopening several sectors of the economy and some areas of tourism, such as Cancun, even though the number of COVID-19 cases and deaths are only rising with each day. The Food and Drug Administration is warning Americans that while pets don't spread coronavirus, infected people can give it to their pets. House cats, as well as big cats in zoos, have been found to be infected with the coronavirus. In a new YouTube video, the FDA says cats and ferrets are the pets most susceptible to COVID-19, but your dogs can catch it too. The FDA also recommends you avoid dog parks for the time being. The six-foot social distancing rule is also recommended for leashed animals as well. The FDA suggests if you do get sick with coronavirus, you might consider getting a pet sitter if possible. Still to come, a new assignment leads a clue to encounter a bear inside of a parking garage. That video is coming up next on the night. Beat.
It's only happened three times before now amid the coronavirus crisis. The Oscars will now be postponed a fourth time. The Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts and Sciences made that announcement today. The 93rd Academy Awards, I think they actually made that announcement yesterday. The 93rd Academy Awards will now be held April 25th, 2021. Our web team keeping track of the coronavirus pandemic with the latest numbers and the many efforts underway to help our community through this trying time. We have an entire page dedicated to this effort. It's all online at KSAT.com. Check this out. A reporter and photojournalist come across a bear inside of a parking garage. The reporter and video journalist say that they were heading to an assignment in downtown White Plains, New York this morning when they saw the black bear. The pair followed the animal out of the garage and up a road, not over the guardrail. The bear eventually disappeared into some woods. There have been multiple bear sightings in this area over the past week. Officials don't know, though, if this is all the same bear. Started off like a joke. <laughs> I thought you were going to tell a joke there. But there was no punchline. Yeah, it's a very weird story. I was going to say, oh, give geez. Steve a sack. He'll have one for you. If you call that a punchline, I don't really. Yeah, not really. No. More of a pun. Pun line. Pun line, yeah, there you go. We can agree on that. Okay. All right, so some clouds in the morning tomorrow, otherwise sunny and making it to 93. Humid, obviously. It's going to be humid the rest of the week. And temperatures aren't going to change much. Mornings in the 70s, afternoons in the low 90s, but some daily pop-up showers here and there, especially as we head toward the weekend. Thank you, Adam. That does it for the night beat. Don't forget, Good Morning San Antonio starts at 4.30. Have a good night.